enemy within and the strategy that is being used to take us captive and so that we can utilize the grace of the Holy Spirit to be, to be free, to live free of that captivity, that slavery. Give us wisdom, give us the ability to explain it and understand it, and, and then courage to apply it. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. I again want to encourage all of us about, you know, we're a knowledge-based ministry, but it's really the living out, it's the choosing to live these principles that makes all the difference. Uh, the, I, personally, the trap that I've seen with the doctrinal church is to focus on knowledge, how much you know and understand as if that was the end of the line. It's not, it's just potential. And this whole Romans chapter 6 is about potential. So from Sunday, I wanted to review just shortly. Our is from Romans chapter 6. We're going to look into chapter 7 today. Our position in Christ creates two great You can walk in, new, in a new kind of life. This is eternal resurrected life. The Holy Spirit creates a spiritual sphere that Paul calls the new man. Also, we can take apart uh, this word to uh, do away with in, in verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Christ so that our body of sin, our sinful body, might be done away with. See, that's potential. Crucifixion is positional. It's positionally crucified, but it's not removed. And, and removed All about benefiting me. Even your relationship with God will be about benefiting me. And that's not wrong because we're the needy ones. We're desperately needy. So when you're hungry for God to fill that, that void within you, that's a good thing. In the mature phases of the Christian life, when you've been filled, you begin to overflow to others. And you're able to live your life because you love God, not because of what God's going to do for you. You're in. You're on the team. You're, part, you're one of the players. You're giving your all to the effort. That's maturity. And that's, where we, that's the super grace life. That's where we want to get to. The old man belief system that we develop out of our, our human experiences puts self as more important than God. We develop our beliefs, expectations, and love strategies with the self as the focus rather than God. See, God's the center of all things, not me. Now, it's taken me a long time to believe that. I knew it a long time before I believed it. So, but the, pro the, the issue is all of our beliefs are stored in neural networks in the brain. And this is pretty new information for me that I'm coming to understand. I kept under, wondering why Paul calls this the body of death, the body of sin, the flesh. Why is it the flesh? Because it's not just your physical body that is your temptation. You're not tempted to go steal something. You know, well, I was tempted to slap somebody this morning, but anyway, I didn't. Uh, but, you know, the temptations are within you. It's your ideas. 
in the way that you react to your life. Why is that the flesh? I'll tell you why. Because it's in your brain. It's a programmed brain. Neural networks all put together to perform these behaviors. And they're instinctive. They're, they're embedded, as Rick says, and they're entrenched in their habits, patterns that we just react. That's part of the thing that we're trying to overcome. You know, I look at Christ and the way he dealt with things. They would sneak up on him with this big, huge uh, issue and try to surprise him to get him to react, to say something they could get him for. He was always just thoughtful. He just stopped, figured out what they were up to, as if he didn't know, and then he dealt with it in a positive way. He dealt with it in a way that was hopefully going to lead them back to him. I'm like, why can't I do that? Why am I still reacting to the adversities or the difficulties or the hindrances or the challenges of my life in a negative way? Why, what is in me that keeps me from being able to just stop and evaluate and do the godly thing? That's what I want to be. That's what I want to share with you, because I think I've come to understand some of that. I think it's important to understand. So after salvation, the Spirit enables us to yield our volition to either God and truth or the sin nature and the world's lies. I really love listening to him, but he said, did you, he said, what was your experience like at Columbia? She, it's supposed to be the, one of the best universities in the world. She said, it was a waste of time, waste of money. He said, what? He takes all that real personally because he's a professor. He said, what? She said, it was all political. Every single thing, no matter what the course, mathematics, they brought in critical race theory. You know, and talking about putting down the West and the Christian idea and that everything was, she said, he said, was there not one course that you took that was on the level? She thought and thought. He said, if there was, you'd know it. And she, he, he, she, she said, it was all just programming. It was all just trying to program me to hate the West, to, to bring in communism so that they can control. Now, that's what's happening in America, and whether we allow it or not is going to be another question, but to whom we yield our function, either the spirit or the sin nature, apply the principles of each respective belief system, we become servants, becoming enslaved through habituation. 
We become enslaved through the habits that are formed. Because the whatever you give yourself to over and over again becomes your habit. Listen, neural pathways are formed to make that uh, a certainty. So uh, an event happens in your life and you've built this way of thinking about things related to that particular area of life and boom, it just fires off. And you're, you're over here, you're reacting before you know it. You know, and you go, wow, how did I get over it again? And you confess, you're back over here in the spirit, and the next thing you know, something else happens, and boom, you're back over here reacting. We've got to break that pattern. You can break that pattern. You don't have to live like that. So, any repeated thought or behavior becomes a habit and creates an automatic response to certain stimuli. All habits and cycles and patterns are stored in the neural networks of the brain, it's called the flesh, where they continue to be used in response to external stimuli. I realized that after many years of being in doctrine and in trying to live the Christian life, I still held, I still had all of these deep ideas and thoughts and feelings and that had nothing that didn't come from the Lord. I'm like, what is that? So to sinful strategies for gratification, we are left more empty and frustrated than when we started. It's called the law of diminishing returns. The more you repeat a behavior, the less satisfaction comes from it. When you become addicted to something, I say that's what addiction is. When people take their first drink, they go, wow, that's the greatest feeling ever. But it's not quite as good. So they begin chasing that experience. And the next drink, and the next drink, then before you know it, you're benefit from it. That's how sin works. Bob Thien called it the pursuit of happiness. You know, you pursued it and pursued it and pursued it, and it never, you never got there. And that's why. All right, let's talk in chapter seven. This is a really an enigma of a chapter. Because people have quoted it, people have misinterpreted it, people say that's talking about unbelievers, not believers. It couldn't be believers in this passage. Paul couldn't be talking about a believer in this passage because of the way he discusses this inner conflict. Well, he is a believer. He's talking, he says, I. He uses himself as an example. When he's writing this book, he is a believer. Would you agree with that? That when he's writing the book of Romans, that he's already saved and it's pretty far down the line theologically? So, all right, in verses 1 through 13, here's another thing I've learned in this book. This book is a discussion of the Mosaic Law. I'm telling you, all the way through, it's a discussion. It's written to Jews. Jews are a big focus of this. Uh, he says, oh, he says in one passage that he's writing to people who know the law. Uh, anyway, in verse 1 through 13, he talks about how you're enslaved to the law as long as you live and blah, blah, blah. And he's going to explain that the purpose of the law or the Jews to keep it, it was to reveal the fact that you couldn't keep it in, in your need for a Savior. That was its whole purpose. It was a grace gift to reveal to you that I need to be saved. It shows you this, this negative picture of yourself because you couldn't live up to it. You know, it was a mirror to show you your depravity and your sinfulness. That's all it was. It was never meant, listen, the Christians, Christians that are living by grace do not live by rules. Now you can use rules as guidelines to show you boundaries. That's great. But if you live your life because you're afraid of breaking the rule and the punish that's going to come from it, then you're into legalism, into works. God does not operate that way. See, the goal is to grow into a love relationship with Him so that you want to do everything for Him. Give yourself to Him. Be His voice. Be His body. His servant. That's the goal. So when you focus on 
keeping the rules and not breaking the rules, you miss the whole point. Your life becomes people who believe they can lose their salvation. They spend their whole life trying to avoid certain behaviors that they think will disqualify them. Well, like the little Korean girl, I guess I'm done. You know, and they go to Romans chapter 6 where it talks about, you know, it's impossible to renew once you've crucified Christ again. Do what? Hebrews 6, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. And uh, so you tell them if that passage is teaching that you lose your salvation, then once you lose it, it's impossible to renew you. And they're like, uh-oh, <laughs> there's a trap. Oh. Anyway, chapter 7, verse 13, 1 through 13, the purpose of the Mosaic Law is to destructive force it is. 13. So death for me? May it never be. Rather, it, it was sin that caused the death. That it might be shown to be sin. Sin might be revealed as sin, affecting my spiritual death through that which is good. That through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. In other words, it becomes obvious. It becomes obvious. You can't avoid the conclusion sin is not good. So, now, my interest today is verses 14 through 23, and then chapter 8 a little bit. In 14 through 23, this is where he gets into this famous inner conflict discussion, this back and forth that he's experiencing himself. So, start with 14. We know the law is spiritual, but I am flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For that which I keep doing, now this is a, an amazing passage of Scripture. For that which I keep doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing the things that I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate to do. Now, Paul describes the status of the believer caught between the sin nature its logic and rationales. And he says, I don't understand that. Why I keep using these same reactions and patterns. Why do I keep going back? Just like I said a minute ago, why do I keep going back to that? He says in verse 17, it's no longer I, but sin dwelling in me. But here's what's important. Uh, the present tenses in this verse indicate an ongoing consistent behaviors. All right. So we're not talking about one event. We're talking about Paul's daily, everyday life. Okay, you with me? Now, he uses three verbs to describe doing. Three different words, three different kinds of doing. Watch. For that which I keep on doing, I don't understand. There's one. For I am not practicing what I want to do, but the very thing I hate is what I'm doing. So there's three doings, right? You see all three of them? They're three different words. They're three different processes. They're three different decisions. Now, let's look at the first one. Caught ere God's am I, he says, for the thing which I keep on doing. Caught ere God's am I is a word that means something produced under pressure. Kata means down, K-A-T-A, -A. down pressure. So ergon or ergodzomai means energy. So it's energy producing something under pressure. What it is is a reaction. It's these reactions that we're talking about. He says, the, the, these, these instinctive, habituated reactions that I keep on doing, I don't understand why. And that was me. I didn't understand why. You know, I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got tons of the Word of God, more than anybody ever in history had. And yet I still can't live free from being discouraged. Why can't I live free of that? 
Well, can I break free of that? Well, you're not trying hard enough. I'm like, no, I'm trying pretty hard. Well, you know, you haven't gone to enough Bible studies. Well, I know I've gone to a lot of Bible studies, you know. Well, you're not in the right situation. So no, it's in me. Whatever is problem here, the reason I can't freely live my life for Christ and I'm still tied to these ideas over here, that stuff's in me. So let's figure out what it is because I want to beat it. So you got this first word for doing, kater gadzama, a reaction produced by pressure. These are the habituated subconscious patterns. And, and, and listen, you, you know that these patterns exist when you get in an intimate relationship. If you're married or in, in some of the close, because you keep going through these same patterns. Because each party has the same issues, you know, until you just get old, too old to care and then you, everything works out. But, uh, but everybody has the same issues, the same complaints, the same trying to change each other issues. And you just go round and round, round and round, round and round. I mean, Rhonda's been trying to change me for years, and that's just like trying to change a stump. You know, all you can do is take a stump grinder to it. Well, here I am. The second word, he says, the th these, these, these habitual reactions, I don't understand why I keep doing them. He said, for I'm not practicing the things I want to do. And that word want is important, but the practice is proso, which means something you consistently do every day. Proso means consistent.
The Holy Spirit gives us a desire, wish, or intention to do the will of God. And we discover, Paul discovered that he was still enslaved to his old sin nature thought patterns. So, let me make sure we understand this. There is, I don't know what I did with it. Here it is. There is Kater Godzomai, which is a habit, habit reaction. This is when you get mad, when you're fearful, you know, something happens and you're fearful, just to, you just react. That's what that is. Then there's proso, which is daily actions. This is your routine. Proso is your routine. Okay? And then poeo. These are the three doings of the Christian life. Is the moment to moment choice choosing. So there's this moment to moment choosing either the sin nature or the Lord. There's your daily practice, which comes from your fellow, T H E L O, your intentions. And then there's the, the instinctive reactions that we have based on how we've programmed ourselves. You know, I've, I've been programmed in a certain way based on my growing, the way I grew up, that I didn't, I didn't let anybody get in my space, especially not in my face. And that's deeply, deeply ingrained in me as a male and as an imbecile. Uh, and so... When people get in my face or want to confront me, they used to, especially that would, could be a dangerous thing because I kind of go to this crazy place. Well, I still find myself doing that. Now, I know where that came from. I know when I started doing that. I was about eighth grade when I had some people bullying me and because I, I was a little at that point. I had some people bullying me, and I just decided, okay, let's see how this ends up. I mean, if I'm going to go to the hospital or go to the cemetery, this is going to stop. And I just sort of went, created this little crazy guy. And I liked him. He really, really was cool. People started <laughs> being afraid of him. People started to know, okay, you don't want to mess with that guy. And I thought, well, that's good. Worldly stuff. Can you imagine Jesus doing that? No. That's not how he would have handled that. No, that's how. See, that's worldly thinking. That's, but look, that stuff's so deeply ingrained in me. And be honest with you, I still like it. I still like that. I just don't want to do that. I don't want to like that. I would, see, I need to stop, I need to stop telling myself I like that and let myself feel that power and I need to surrender that, and I need to come over here and feel God's power. This is the stuff I'm talking about that I deal with, that I want to share with you, and I hope that's helpful. But Now we get to verse 18 through 23, and he says, For I know nothing good dwells in me. And that word good is the word agathos. And, the, and Jesus is the one who said, Only God is agathos. Because there's kalos, which means pleasant, good in a sense that this was a good day. And there's agathos, which is divine good, good that benefits God. And he says, I understand that in my old self, before salvation, there's nothing good in me. There's no divine spark. There's no divine good. There's no divine anything in me. And that's called total depravity. And he said, it in my flesh, he said, I have a desire and intent to do, to do agathos. I want to do good. But my, and listen, and let me read this in, into, because my, he says, but my instinctive reactions, 
Makar Gazuma. That is in my flesh. For the desire, the thelo, the intention to do agathos is in me, but the doing, there, see there's kater gadzuma, the doing of the good is not. In other words, this, these instinctive reactions that I have to life, because mostly the way we live by our life, look, your subconscious can, handles about 95% of your active actions. Only about 5% of your actions are conscious. The rest are processes that are going on behind the scenes. And I mean, there's so much going on in your mind and your brain right now. You just, you know, as a medical person, you may understand some of that, Patty. But, you know, I've just recently learned all these things that, 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 that the intentional part of you, unless you expand that, is very small. The rest of it's just stuff going on behind the scenes. Now, here's a question for you. Are we supposed to deal with some of that stuff going on behind the scenes, especially if it's producing non-Christian behavior, would you think? I think so. That's what we're after here. So he says for verse 19, for the good, the agathos that I desire, I do not practice. And there's your word proso again. The good that I want or I intend for my life to be producing I'm not doing every day. I'm not practicing this. Instead, I practice the very evil that I don't want to do. But if I am doing the very thing I don't want to do, intend to do, I am no longer the one doing it. Now that's interesting, isn't it? I am no longer the one doing it, but sin or the sin nature that dwells in me doing it. So, He's not saying the sin nature is a person within itself. It's just an old way of thinking about things. It's an old way of looking at your life, at yourself, at, uh, at your relationships. It's just an old way. It's not God's way. And, and this is what he's talking about, these instinctive reactions. He said, I want to practice this intentional life where I do agathos good through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, but I, I find myself controlled by these instinctive reactions that are not good. He says, I find then the principle. Now, does your Bible say law? In verse 21, I find then the principle or the law. That word is namas, and it does mean law. It's the word used for the Mosaic law, but here it's used as a law or a concept. I find the concept that evil is present in me, the, the same person who desires to do agathos good. So I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. See, that's the spirit man. I joyfully concur with the law of God, the concepts of God in the inner man, but I see a different law, a different concept where to, in, in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind. Prisoner of the concept of sin, which is in my members. Now that's his physical body. That's for years that's, that's plagued me and to understand how my mind that would take me astray from God could be my flesh. You follow the dilemma there? I mean, if it's your mind, if it's your thinking, how is it there? How is it your body? Well, it's your brain. You've got a corrupted brain. I mean, the God said brains, and he said, give me a little one that runs backwards, you know? I thought he said trains, you know? Did I, did I tell y'all why the, tom the tomato blushed? Did I tell you that? Y'all don't remember, do you? He saw the salad dressing. <laughs> I know, I couldn't help it. Just a little commercial. I learned that from Gary Horton, just to give a little commercial. Just a little relaxation. Just a little. <laughs> well, that's just, that's his normal look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> so, 18 through 23, nothing good, total depravity. I desire and intend to do the good, but my instinctive reactions don't produce divine good. It's no longer me causing these reactive habits to be sinful, uh, but sin dwelling, indwelling my flesh. I find the principle that in the inner man connected to the Holy Spirit, the desire and intention to do the will of God, but in my flesh, is it making war against my mind and taking me captive to the sin that... that so... This understanding of the brain is in this, these last few years of my life has finally helped me understand why these patterns are so pervasive and why they're so difficult to get rid of. And why these things that came out of your early life especially just seem to continue to plague you and become a barrier for you to live free and to live content and peaceful. Why these things continue to fight and try to take you captive. That's what he said. These things fight against you, trying to take you captive. That's amazing that there's an enemy with it. See, the devil, the world, the devil is, is, has designed the world system to appeal to every different type of sin nature trend and every different pattern of sinful thoughts and behaviors. There's something for him. Religion. This is for the ascetic person, the person that likes things orderly, that, that likes things to be fair, that this weight ought to equal that weight. So that's what the guy in China told this girl. He said, these things you've done are just beyond forgiveness. You know, there's too much weight there. Of course, that's a lie, but so the ascetic person loves religion. They, they gravitate toward systems, quote, Christian systems. And listen, any, any Christian system that does not operate from grace is not Christian. I don't care what you call it. They have simply taken religion and hijacked the name of Jesus Christ. And, and they're, that's the definition of using his name in vain. For an empty, selfish, self-centered purpose. So... Now, I'm no judge of people's motives, but you can't have Christianity without Christ paying for the sins, offering that as a free gift and you accepting it by faith. Paul describes his own inner conflict between the sin nature and old man concepts compared with the Holy Spirit and divine concepts, and so describes the inner conflict of every church age believer. I would encourage you to try to understand this old self that, that keeps being your, the hurdle in your life. Prior to salvation, Paul possessed no divine good within him. Total depravity. Total depravity is defined as the fall of man caused our human nature to be totally corrupted, devoid of righteousness. Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Spirit motivates the believer to wish or intend to meet his needs by obeying God's will. This emptiness within you is what creates the hunger and thirst in your life that drives you to find some way of meeting that need. So you can meet it you initially in your life. You go through the sin picture in the world. You have. But once you get saved, you now have God as your option to meet this inner hunger that you have. John 7, 37-39. In spite of his intention to yield to the Spirit, he often found himself yielding to the sin nature and old man beliefs. In verse 20, he said, it's no longer me that is doing it, but the sin dwelling in my body. Now, that's not, he's not trying to avoid responsibility for his choices. He's saying that this thing in me uh, has a life of its own. It's not a person. It's not, a, it's not a, a, an entity that's alive and aware and and making, trying to destroy me, it's me having been oriented wrong, and those patterns are still operating. That's what he's talking about. Breaking those patterns. Listen, when you're filled with truth, when you're full of truth, and you know truth, and you love the Lord, and you're trying to live for the Lord, and you're able to remove these things, your spirit life takes off like a rocket ship. That's the goal. All right. In spite of his intention to yield this spirit, he often found himself yielding to the sin nature. 
caught her God's in my produce something under pressure, habituated patterns of thought, feeling, and acting from pressure. This word law or concept, law namas, is used mostly for the Mosaic law. But he says, I've se- I see a different law, a concept or principle. And he said, this, this sin that dwells in me is making war against me. It's a fight against your mind. So it's a fight against keeping you from being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. Taking my thoughts captive. This word, taking, taking him captive, is the same word that he used about taking every thought captive to Christ. It's the same idea. So 2 Corinthians 10.5, he says, the goal of our ministry is to bring, to tear down all the strongholds that you're guarding yourself within your own mind. The walls you've built to protect you from this life. You got to tear that down. And then you got to take every thought captive and, and give it to Christ. Let Christ, let the Spirit be the ruler to reign over your thoughts. Here he says that the sin nature in the old way of thinking is trying to do that very thing with thoughts to take you captive and enslave you to living like that, living the old way. All right. Old sin nature plus old man beliefs are the deeply habituated patterns. There are default under pressure that seek to regain control of the soul. The fight against the spirit is to take our thoughts captive to be controlled by sin And our goal is to take our thoughts and let them and yield them to the spirit all the way to the depths of your soul, not just on the surface, not just so that you look the part or you can even act the part, but you really are the part. You got to let your whole self be examined, you know, wipe. What is it? Clean, clean out my heart. What's that with hyssop? What's that psalm? I forget. It's about clean, clean out. Give me a clean heart, O oh Lord. Whiter than snow. There you go. That's a song, isn't it? Can you sing it? <laughs> we'll run everybody off, wouldn't it? I hear you. Now, he gets down to verse 24 and 25, and he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. He says, here's the condition of the believer after salvation. We're saved. We're in Christ. We've got this permanent victory, but we're still here fighting this war. And I'm a, it's this a wretched, I'm a mess. I'm a wreck inside. always done this? Am I living this disciplined life because this, that, would, that would do that even if I wasn't saved? That's just me? Or am I doing this for the Lord? Why am I doing, why do I do what I do? See, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 or 8, I think, says our eternal rewards, when we, when we stand before God, He's going to throw everything in the fire, you know, and, and what burns up and then what's left is going to be our rewards. And he said, you know what the rewards are based on? 
motives. Not what you do, not what you don't do. Motives. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen, guys, Christianity, real Christianity, opens you up, opens up your heart. It opens up all of you to see who am I, what am I, what do I believe, and what, how am I living my life, and who am I living it for, and why am I doing it? It scours you. See, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the joints and the what? Marrow. You know what marrow is? It's the insides of the bone. He doesn't peel the flesh off and then the meat off and get down and pull the bones apart. He does all that and then he takes the bones and cuts them open to see the core of you. I just want to challenge you to look at your core, to look at what's going on in your heart. Not, not to say that you're not living this great wonder. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. I just want to challenge you. This is my challenge anyway. And maybe I'm selfish to teach this all the time, but I really think it's the, I really think it's the hurdle that every believer comes to after they get their sword and they get their armor and they learn how to defend themselves and they learn how to swing the sword and they learn to be a soldier and they learn what the mission is. Then the commander says, now it's time to look at the person in the armor. Let's look at what's going on in the armor. I mean, who are you? What are you? What are you believing? What are you holding on to? And why are you doing what you're doing? Those are the questions that, that, the mature, that maturity leads you to. That's maturity is why. All right. The Mosaic Law was a grace provision to, build, to reveal man's status in Adam. And our need for Christ, the Jews turned it into a work system which by which they believed that by keeping they could be saved. That's amazing. But it, it shouldn't be amazing because so many people do the very same thing now. They turn Christian principles into the same kind of thing, that you've got to live this way or you're, you're toast. So rather than hinder sinful behavior, the law and the law and Paul explains that the law made sin more obvious. It made him want to do it more. Have you ever told one of your kids that they couldn't do something? They just want it more. Just tell them, no, you, that's, no, that's not for you. If you want them to do it. Or if you want them to want it. Look, just tell them, no, you can't come back to church. There's no coming back to this church. And then they'll want to do it. That's the point I'm making. I'm just being goofy. After salvation, the believer is hard caught in the war between the influence of the flesh, which is the sin nature and acquired beliefs and patterns, and the influence of the spirit, the divine nature and his acquired beliefs and strategies, and must decide whom he or she will yield, to whom you, he or she will yield and be enslaved. You're going to be enslaved to one or the other because you operate off habit. Your brain works off habit. Simple as that. Whatever you do over and over becomes your habit. It's been that way your whole life. I mean, you grew up tying your shoe a certain way, you still tie it that way. Habit. You know, you grew up thinking about things a certain way, habit. That's how we, that's how we operate. That's how the body operates, through habit. Everything is that way. The inner conflict carries no condemnation. Listen, it's okay if you're not doing it. It's okay if you're not there. It's okay if you mess up. It's okay. And listen, we got to, here's the deal. We got to treat each other that way. We got to treat each other that way. You say, well, I'm so self-righteous and judgmental. I just judge everybody. Okay, let's grow out of that. But in the meantime, you're forgiven. You know, I, I, I get angry easily and I snap at people and, okay, well, let's grow out of that. Let's, let, what, let's find the root of that. What, what are you telling yourself that that says that's the right thing to do or appropriate or somehow you're going to benefit from doing that? Because that's a lie and you keep telling yourself that lie. And now you've turned it into your habit to automatically tell that 
Every time you do that behavior, you should step back and go, what was I, what was I thinking? What was I telling myself that said, that's the right thing to do? That will benefit me. Because it's not true. You, you have to break that pattern. Listen, and when you can catch yourself in that process, hear your own thoughts, that's when you can go, uh-oh, not going there today. Not going to get mad. Not going to get mad today. Not going to be afraid today. Not going to regret my life and look back on the things that have happened and go, golly, not going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to trust that the Lord has forgiven those things. All right. So there's no condemnation. Our choice to focus on the Holy Spirit and categorical Bible doctrine enables us to recognize our false behaviors so that we can remove our self-centered beliefs and exchange them for the thinking of Christ. And that's what transformation is. That's what spiritual growth is. That's the if you want a summary of, of transformation and spiritual growth, it's that right there, is to recognize your false behaviors and remove them and exchange them for the thinking of Christ. That's what growth is. The word he uses in chapter 8, verse 5 through 6, for neo, let me read that because i got a second. He says, for those who are, th whose minds, those who are focused, Enslaved minds, for now, on the things of the flesh and what the flesh gives you and the, the benefits the flesh offers. But those who are dominated by the Spirit focus their mind on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. It leads to temporal death out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. He said the sinful mind, the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not submit itself to the law of God or the concepts of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, when you live your life in the flesh, and I think most people that call themselves Christians do that. Maybe that's unfair. Maybe I don't know, and maybe I shouldn't say. But I think it's true that very few people understand about confessing sin and being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and listening to the Spirit. They don't, I, think, I think their idea of being a Christian is to be nice. To be nice. And... I, I think that they're going to spend their life and, and not ever overcome it. Look at, look at what, what your thinking is. Examine your own thoughts. Ask yourself, why do I do that? Why do I feel that way? You know, we've had a lot of turmoil, especially in the last year or two, about moving and what the ministry is going to be and people have left and got hurt feelings and become frustrated. And my question is why? I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, I've been in all that too, getting frustrated and wondering why don't they, why doesn't everybody see it my way? Why don't you look at it my way? And the Lord says, because they don't need to see it your way. Dummy. They need to see it my way. And you need to just relax and let me work this thing out. And you need to just go with the flow. Just stay with the people I've assigned you to. Just stay with their, you know, if they stay, they stay. If they go, they go. You've been assigned. I've, you've been attached. And until that changes, look, I'm here. I'm attached. I'm going to help however I can. I'm going to try to be positive and keep a positive look ahead because... We're, we're going to a different place and we're going to do a different kind of ministry. I think, I think, truly believe that if, if we allow the Lord to lead us in that, I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful ministry. I think we're all going to see that all these many 40 years of taking in doctrine is going to turn out to be about nurturing another generation of baby believers into, the, into maturity 
so that we can have a nation that's free and and, and, and that your kids and grandkids can have a place to go to church and that there's going to be principles of doctrine and grace that are being taught in this nation. That's my dream. That's my hope. I want to be part of helping this next group of people. And look, I say I want to. I really don't. I'm just too daggum lazy. It's work putting up with baby believers. It's going to be some patience involved and you know, I just remember when I was just a punk thinking I knew everything and being self-righteous. And you may say, well, you're still a punk. You know, maybe I am a 65-year-old punk. But I think we're going to have a good time. And I think you're going to be up to your eyeballs in opportunities to help hungry people. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're not there. All indications that they are. All indications are that's what we're seeing. Rhonda and I, we live out there. We, we interact in the community. There's just an openness. Uh, this generation of kids is the most lied to generation in American history. They've, they've grown up under nothing but propaganda. And, and I'm telling you, there's about to be a backlash and hunger for, for understanding. Help me understand why I feel the way I do. Help me understand my life. Help me understand what God's plan is. A, the, the Baptist preacher told me God has a plan for my life, but he didn't know what it was. Do you know what it is? I'm going, yeah, I know what it is. I know exactly what it is. Sit down and let's talk about it. That's going to be your opportunity, in my opinion, and we'll see. Father, we're grateful for Still being here, still being here. We're grateful for a pastor who's 82 years old and still wants to be Caleb. Still, he thinks he's Caleb. So let him be Caleb. And let's go and help. Let's go and help out. Just do what little we can and offer our support and be positive and Nurture where we're able to nurture and encourage and correct even to give our services, to give our, our money, to give our love. And let's, let's take this message of God's grace to another generation of hungry people like in the 60s and 70s that want to know you, want to grow in a relationship with you. And Father, we've been prepared for that day.